Hello folks, it's story time again. We're reading from the book A Journey, and uh, we're now going to take a look at chapter 9 entitled Kibbutz. Um, last go round, we looked at Paris, and I think we ended with uh, my friends and I having gone to to see Lady and the Lady and the Tramp at the movie theater. And the last thing I said to you folks was, classic Disney movies are good in any language. But actually what the book reads and what I should have said was, classic Disney movies are great in any language. And it was, it was great. So now let's, uh, oh, I also wanted to mention that last week I was talking to my brother and his wife and Mary had told me about uh, where she works. They do um, little videos sometimes. And um, to keep people's interest, they'll have something funny going on, like somebody juggling behind the speaker or some goofy thing that, that you know, uh, keeps people watching. Well, uh, you know what? I wish I had some fun thing to do for you guys. I asked my wife a little bit ago if she'd be interested in doing funny things, maybe run back and forth uh, juggling fire torches or something while I'm reading. But um, she just walked in from the garden, by the way. I don't think she's going to do that. So uh, unless I can come up with some, you know, a juggling llama or something that would really be marvelous, you'll probably just have to settle for hearing the book. Sorry about that. So let's press on with uh, chapter 9, Kibbutz. Starts with a journal entry uh, dated Thursday, December 16th of 1976. Well, at the moment I'm sitting in, really it's outside, the train station at Belgrade, Yugoslavia. We left from Paris on Tuesday morning, as was planned, but we're a little late. Monday night, we all went to a concert, Caravan and Kevin Ayers and Soft Machine. I wasn't familiar with either of those bands prior to the concert. It really was great. I must admit that I was a little surprised at myself, however, because I bought a petite trip for Catherine and me. For some stupid reason, I decided to take up an offer from a guy standing in the concert line who was selling acid. It was nice, but I don't think I'll make a habit of it. We arrived home about 1.30 or 2, and then talked until probably about 4. I was supposed to meet Lubo at 6.30, but managed to fall asleep about 5, and didn't wake up until he called me at 10 minutes to 7. He was a little upset, to say the least. I raced to the station, but when I got there, I didn't see him. I was sure he had gone alone. He didn't, though, because I'm now in Yugoslavia, waiting for the train to Greece. After Lubo's phone call, I frantically hightailed it to the agreed-upon location, only to find that he wasn't there. I looked around and waited for 20 or 30 minutes, the whole time becoming less and less hopeful that I had a ride. Just when I was about to leave, Lubo came out of the cafe where he'd been enjoying a cappuccino and watching me become more and more sure that he was gone. But he wasn't bitter. Tuesday, we drove from Paris to a town about 190 kilometers from into Austria. I drove a few hundred kilometers with Lubo telling me how to drive all the way. We stayed in a guest house that night, and the next morning continued on through Austria and Hungary, finally arriving here in Belgrade about four this morning. Lubo was more than willing to have me drive, which I was happy to do. Between all the snow throughout Austria and Hungary and Lubo's incessant commentary on my driving, it did, however, prove to be a little stressful. Lubo made sure to let me know that if I were to be in a car accident or run into a farm animal that wandered into the road, which was not out of the question considering the horrible driving conditions, I would probably end up in jail, regardless of the cost. He shared this encouraging news as we were driving in the pitch dark at night during a heavy snowfall just outside of Budapest. We had stopped, I think, twice by this time to knock off the snow that had covered our headlights. G 
good fun. With the exception of some pretty horrible weather and a couple intimidating Hungarian border guards, the road trip from Paris to Belgrade was good. I even received a little geography lesson when driving across a bridge that spans the Danube River in Budapest. Turns out that Buda and Pest are actually two cities that weren't joined together to become Budapest until the late 1800s. I never knew. As mentioned in the journal entry, we arrived to Belgrade about 4 a.m. Lubo was in a hurry to get to his folks' home, so instead of bringing me into the city center, he dropped me off on a road a few miles outside of town and pointed me in the right direction. I think Lubo was still, a little, was still a little ticked about me causing us to get a late start from Paris. I started walking in the direction of town and along the way noticed a little working man's cafe next to the railroad tracks in what appeared to be a train yard. Inside were a few guys who looked as if they might work for the railroad. My hope was that someone in the cafe would be able to tell me how long it would take to walk to the train station. I definitely didn't speak any Serbian or whatever dialect the gentlemen in the cafe were speaking, and none of them seemed to know English. After trying some words like locomotive and even chugga chugga chugga, and then pointing to my pocket watch, one of the fellows communicated to me that I was about 45 minutes from the station. Turns out I really was. Before leaving the cafe, I ordered a cup of coffee and had my first encounter with the Turkish kind. I wasn't aware that there were fine coffee grounds in the bottom of the cup until I ended up with a mouthful. Lesson learned. Journal entry, Friday, 12-17. Well, I caught the train at the station, and when I was just getting on, I met a boy from Yugoslavia. He was with a group of students who were going to the town of Skopje for a grammar contest. I sat with about seven of them, and it was really nice. One guy played the accordion, very, very fantastic. I drank some rum and talked a lot and fell asleep. In Skopje, I had to change cars, and once again, as I was getting on, I met two brothers from France. They were also traveling to Athens, so we came together. It's almost unbelievable when thinking of all that has occurred in Yugoslavia since my brief visit in 1976. I certainly never expected to one day be hearing about the brutal fighting between Serbs and Croats, or to see the breakup of the country into Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Macedonia. Did I miss anyone? I would have never thought that the future of Yugoslavia would take all the turns that it did, not while laughing and drinking rum and listening to accordion music on a train with a group of fun-loving young Yugoslavian students. <coughs> we arrived about 12 this afternoon. As I was changing money, I met another boy from Switzerland. His name was Beat. We spent the afternoon together, and then I came here to the airport. I arrived at the airport about 7, and now it's around 11. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My flight is at 12.45 tomorrow, and if I'm not asked to leave, I'll be spending the night here. Once again, as always, I must thank the Lord for making everything so fantastic. Sunday, 12.19. All right, it's really great. Before I get into what's happening now, I'll continue with the night at the airport. At about 12, I met a guy named Roger from New York. He was going home after a year's travel in Europe. Well, he left about 4, and I went to sleep. The next day, I left on the plane, as was scheduled. Flying to Israel from Greece in 1976 was my first experience with serious airport security. While traveling, I always carried a buck knife in my pocket. Back then, it really didn't occur to me that trying to get on an airplane with a pocket knife was going to be such a huge issue. In the case of flying to Israel, it was. I've, I've ever since been grateful to the kindly security folks 
that were willing to let me run back to the baggage area and put my knife in the backpack. I still have that trusty buck knife today. In fact, I have it right here, and I'll show you. This is my trusty buck knife, and I really was glad that they, you know, let me go put it back in my pack. It's been a great knife for a lot of years. All right. <clears throat> we arrived in Tel Aviv around 3. There were about six people from America also going to a kibbutz. We all went to the youth hostel together. I couldn't change my Greek money at the airport, airport so I didn't have any money when I got to the, we got to the hostel. Luckily, it was possible to make a deal with the man behind the counter. He kept my camera as insurance and let me stay the night and eat. This morning, I found out how difficult it is to change Greek money in Israel. There were two banks near the hostel, both of which wouldn't take it. As it turned out, I had to go into the center where there was one bank that would take it. Well, after getting back my camera, I headed in the direction of Jerusalem. I don't know what it's like today, but in Israel in 1976, it was nearly impossible to exchange Greek into Israeli currency. It was nice of the guy at the hostel to allow me to stay the night and have some dinner with the promise to pay him the next day. I'm pretty sure he knew the cheapy little camera I left with him as collateral wasn't even worth the cost of my bill. After settling up at the hospital and get, hostel and getting back my little Polaroid, it was time to hit the road and stick out my thumb. Actually, at that time in Israel, Proper hitchhiking hiking etiquette was not to stick out your thumb, but to point at the ground. I was picked up by one really nice guy named Mark, who was originally from Israel, but went to New York when he was 15. He now lives here again with his wife and three children. He invited me to his house for lunch, and it was really nice. My destination today was Kibbutz Nakshun the place that Terry, the girl in England, told me about. I had always been interested in the idea of communes and communal living. I never really had an opportunity, however, to pursue that interest while in the States. Now, in the land of Israel, I was being given a chance to do just that. Kibbutz refers to the communal settlements that can be found scattered throughout Israel. The first of these communities were established in the early 1900s, and I believe that today there are around 275 of the settlements in the land. Uh, it's my understanding that the residents of the first kibbutz were Jewish pioneers from Eastern Europe, wanting to return to the land of their forefathers. Understandably, there was a significant increase in the number of kibbutzim after the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Many of those wanting to become residents were refugees from Europe and the Arab world, and many of those ended up on kibbutz. Nakshan, I believe, was originally established by immigrants from Eastern Europe around 1950. Because I'd been given an address for a kibbutz, and because Terry, the nice young lady driving the convertible in England, had also given me her name to use as a reference, I chose to make Nakshan the first place I would try to become a volunteer. Journal entry. I finally made it here about 8 this evening, and I think that it's really going to be nice. Once again, the Lord has pulled a few strings for me. I think everybody here, the volunteers, had to go through the office in Tel Aviv to get here. Had I done that, I'm sure I wouldn't have gotten to come because they really don't need anyone. As it is, though, it's possible that I'll be staying for quite a while. Thank you so much. Well, I think I'll go to bed now because I want to get up early for breakfast. Turns out that just showing up at, at Kibbutz Nakshan was perhaps the best way for me to go about it. Had I gone through the agency that handles the placement of volunteers onto different kibbutz, they would have told me that Nakshan wasn't in need of any additional workers. And now, thinking about that now, 
that would have been just fine too because I would have likely found a place on another kibbutz. Um, on another kibbutz. It was pretty cool though to be able to stay in the community that had been recommended by Terry in England. Like most kibbutzim of that time, Nakshon was truly a share and share alike community where everybody was in the same big social boat. Everything was the property of the whole community. Fortunately for me, and for countless volunteers from all over the world that had lived on a kibbutz, kibbutzim were often places in need of extra manpower, and as a result, in need of volunteers to help do the work. In return for being a volunteer, you received a bed, sometimes two to a bungalow, sometimes a private room, all of your meals, which were eaten together with the whole community, and I think what worked out to about $35 a month. You could maybe even get a ration of cigarettes if you were a smoker. Also, there were occasional bus trips for the volunteers where they would bring us to some very cool place in the country. Living on kibbutz was a pretty great gig. From what I understand, the first kibbutzim in Israel were primarily agricultural settlements that over the years have branched into various kinds of industry. Nakshon was a farming community where, in addition to growing crops, they raised turkeys and chickens. They also operated a small glass-making business with a gift shop and a factory where simulated star sapphires were made. My work in the community varied from repairing kerosene heaters to working with the groundskeepers to catching turkeys and chickens for market. I also spent a week or two washing dishes in the kitchen where the kibbutz kids went to high school. My favorite job was definitely working outside on the grounds and in the gardens. Excuse me. <clears throat> Journal entry, Monday 12-7. I can't believe how fast time is going by. It's already after Christmas, and it seems like I just got here. Actually, I did just get here. Well, today I telephoned Mom and Dad, and everything is good. They also said that they're talking about Mom coming with Jack and Olga. We'll talk more about that, though. Turns out, my mom was considering coming to Israel along with her brother Jack and his wife Olga. The last week has really been great. Friday we had a Christmas party and it was fun. Yesterday I began working on the kerosene heaters. I really like this job. The man who showed me how is named Avi. Avi was a Jewish gentleman originally from New York. He was an older guy and I believe may have been one of the early settlers of Nakshun. He, like other Jewish folks who immigrated to Israel from other countries, had made what was called Aliyah which loosely translate to the act of going up towards Jerusalem. He, like those settlers of the early 1900s, wanted to return to the land of his Jewish forefathers. Journal entry, Thursday, January 12th. The work I've been doing has varied from chickens to kerosene heaters to washing dishes at the high school, which I've been doing for the last week. It's not bad, but I'll be happy to change. Today I missed the bus and caused a bit of havoc. Oops. Friday, February 4th. First of all, thank you, Lord, for making things so great. At the moment, I'm at the St. George Hotel, and here also is Mom, Jack, Olga, and Ethel, all with a tour group of Christians. It's fantastic. They arrived last night, and so did I. It was so good to see them all, especially Mother. She brought all kinds of beautiful homemade goodies to eat. Life is good. Today I went on the tour with everyone in Bethlehem, the Garden Tomb, and the Sheep Market to name just a few of the places we went. It was a full day. Tomorrow Mom is coming to the kibbutz and is staying the night. It was an unexpected and wonderful surprise when I received the news that Mom was coming to Israel. Until then, I didn't even know my Uncle Jack and Aunt Olga were involved with bringing tour groups to the Holy Land. 
Mom and my Aunt Ethel, wife to Mom's brother Pat, would both be joining one of these groups with Jack and Olga as their guides. I was able to meet up with everyone in Jerusalem and got invited to join the group for a day of touring. Jerusalem, by the way, just might be my favorite place in the entire world. The colors and smells and sounds of the Arab market or souk and the old city in the old city, along with the flavors of a Turkish style cup of coffee with a piece of baklava. Oh, yes. That will forever be etched in my brain. Throughout the course of the day, my mom made sure to introduce me to all the nice church people on the bus. I can still remember her referring to me as one of the pillars of the church back home. I also remember feeling sick to my stomach when she said that because it was so not true. The love of a mother can sometimes definitely be blind. Mom and I took the bus back to Nakshan and she had a chance to see, at least a little, what kibbutz life was like. Everybody made sure to make my mom feel more, more than welcome. We even had a bonfire the night she stayed, which meant hearing some really great music. Inevitably, when we got together around the fire, someone would pull out a guitar and sing. Truly good times. I'm so glad that mom had a chance to visit kibbutz and to see the land of Israel. Although she was only in the community for a couple days, she met some really great folks from all over the world. One of the people who took extra time and effort to make my mom feel at home was an Irishman named Sean. Sean was one of those people who befriended everyone. He was in Israel enjoying some time away from his job in Great Britain by taking a working vacation as a volunteer on kibbutz. Sean was a gifted storyteller. In my mom's words, he was someone who had kissed the Blarney Stone. Although I think Sean's stories were all true, they were sometimes a little hard to believe. For instance, he told me about a time when, while managing a hotel in Europe, one of his frequent guests was Rock Hudson. Mr. Hudson, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I really need to find someone to read these things, this book that doesn't cough all the time. Sorry about that. Mr. Hudson apparently had a favorite brand of champagne, and Sean was on several occasions called upon to bring a bottle of this bubbly to the hotel room. It was when Sean told me that Rock Hudson was, without a doubt, gay, that I had some trouble believing his story. The Rock Gay? No way. Keep in mind, it was early 1977 when I was hearing this very unexpected news. It wasn't until 1985 when, tragically, Mr. Hudson died of the complications of AIDS and his sexuality became openly known to the public. Sean had become privy to this information several years prior. Not only was Sean someone whom you were compelled to listen to, but his genuine interest in people also made him someone you felt like you could freely talk to. Perhaps even Mr. Hudson experienced that freedom. In addition to meeting some really great people at the kibbutz, Mom also had the privilege of meeting Punky and Eddie. Punky and Eddie were the two nice doggies that lived along with the volunteers. Often I would allow both of the dogs to come into my room. So it wasn't such a surprise to come home one day and find Eddie lying on my bed. Guess I left the door open. I didn't mind that Eddie was in my room or even on my bed until sometime later when I noticed the bump on my head. Well, turns out that bump was actually a tick. A tick. This big, fat, nasty thing was sucking the blood out of my head. Fortunately, somebody nearby was skilled at removing a nasty blood-sucking tick off your head with the use of a burning cigarette. Although I still loved Punky and Eddie, they were no longer wel welcome in my room. I never did find more ticks on the doggies, so it's possible that Eddie wasn't the culprit. 
he and Punky still weren't coming back into the room. Journal entry, Saturday, 3-5. It's really about time I got my act together and wrote something. Many things have happened in the past few weeks. At the moment, there's a new guy in the room named Paul from California. Tonight, he played some really nice guitar and sang some songs he wrote. It was great. Paul and I became pretty good friends and on one occasion traveled together into Jerusalem where we spent the day with some nice young California girls. These three Jewish princesses were friends of Paul's from school and were now attending Hebrew University in Jerusalem. During our visit, Paul and I took over occupancy of the little dorm kitchen and kicked out some pretty fine eggplant parmesan. I love the way that sometimes where you are and what you're doing and what you're smelling and what all your senses are saying come together with what you're eating and make it taste extra good. That was probably the best eggplant parmesan I've ever had. Also, while visiting with the girls, I decided to have my ear pierced. It just seemed like the thing to do at the time. The only dilemma was that depending on which ear you chose, it might imply that you were gay or a convict or a whatever. I just wanted to have an earring. We went with the left ear. I'm not sure how they do it at the ear piercing place in the mall, but at Hebrew U, it's a big needle and a cork and a camera case to smack the needle so it goes through the ear, my ear, and into the cork. My lovely ear piercer did use ice to numb up the ear first, which I was very grateful for. Also, it helped that there was wine with the delicious eggplant parmesan. After saying goodbye to the ladies, Paul and I went to the old city souk where a silversmith made a little silver stud earring while I waited. It was all very cool. Although I haven't worn an earring for many years, the hole created by smacking a big needle with a camera case never has closed. My, over the years, my kids would sometimes stick something in there. Living on kibbutz meant that you would likely meet and work with people from all over the world. It also meant you would likely never see most of those people again. There was, there, this was not the case with Paul. About 25 years after living on Kibbutz Nakshan, and while on holidays at Disneyland with my wife and three kids, I was waiting in line to buy tickets for the Indiana Jones ride. I looked over at a guy who was buying tickets for another ride, and lo and behold, it was Paul. How cool was that? Time didn't allow us to reminisce for very long, but it was such an unexpected and wonderful surprise to see him. Journal entry continued, Saturday, 3-5. About a week ago, Andy and I, Andy was a fellow volunteer, originally from England, went to Tel Aviv, and while there we met a very nice young lady on the beach, Ronnie. Since then I have spoken with her on the phone and invited her to the Purim party, which was last night. Purim, as recorded in the Bible in the book of Esther, commemorates the deliverance of the Jewish people living in Persia in the time of Esther, somewhere between 331 and 460 B.C., according to the introduction to Esther in my Bible. In a nutshell, I'll see. I always called this guy Asa Harris. Asa Saris. Ahasar... Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus, maybe? Ahasuerus was king of Persia. Ahasuerus had a big party and got a little drunk. Vashti, the king's wife, had a little party of her own. Ahasuerus wanted his wife, the queen, to come and join him at his party so he could show her off. Vashti said no. Ahasuerus got ticked. Ahasuerus dumped Vashti. Ahasuerus held a beauty pageant so he could choose a new queen. The winner of the pageant was a lovely young maiden named Esther. Esther was beautiful. Esther was Jewish. Haman was the prime minister of Persia. Haman hated the Jews. 
Haman had a plot to kill all of the Jews. Esther learned of his plan. Esther told the king. The king was not pleased. The king had Haman hung on a gallows. Esther and all the Jews of Persia were saved. A holiday was established to commemorate these events. Jews worldwide celebrate this holiday today. The word parim, I think, just means lots, like in casting lots. Haman had cast lots when he chose the day that he was going to destroy the Jews. Thus, the celebration called Purim, and thus, Casino Night. Nakshan, like probably many non-religious kibbutzim in Israel, celebrated Purim with a casino night. On this particular night, I was selected to be the cashier. Actually, it was a demanding job handling, handing out all the allotted amount of fake money to gamblers hungry to lay their play money down. And it wasn't just one denomination. We're talking a variety of bills. But it's okay. I held strong. There was wine with Perrine. Her parents told her she couldn't come, but being quite determined, she came anyway. It was a great surprise, but unfortunately, her father wasn't far behind. She didn't get to stay for the party, but we planned to see each other again. The party last night was lots of fun. I was the cashier who gave everybody money to gamble with. The person who asked me to be the cashier seemed to think that because I was from America, I would know something about casinos. I didn't. I don't know if I ever mentioned our volunteer trip to Mount Hermon. We all took the chairlift up and played in the snow. It was a good time. One of our volunteer trips was to the Golan Heights, and in particular, to Mount Hermon. It was a unique experience to be in, the, in sunny Israel and at the same time have a snowball fight. That same day we visited Mivzar Nimrod, a 20th century crusader castle. Like I said earlier, living on kibbutz was a pretty great gig. Most of my friends on the kibbutz were volunteers like myself. Two of my closest friends, however, were official members of Nakshan. Steve was originally from Chicago, and his lovely wife Frida was from South Africa. Steve was a mechanic by profession, but had also been in a rock and roll band back in Chicago. During those nights around the kibbutz campfire, it was often Steve who would pull out a guitar and share his great musical talent. Whenever, whenever there was need to repair one of the many machines or vehicles in the community, Steve was the man. On occasion, you would find him working on one of the beautiful Harleys that he had brought with him to Nakshan. One of the bikes was chopped and looked like it was right out of Easy Rider. That's the one that I took a ride on to Tel Aviv. Although I was only riding on the back, 120 miles per hour, even from the back, felt really, really fast. I've been okay never to go that fast on a motorcycle again. I, I got to add here, since I was at Nakshan, I've always thought that we did 120 miles on that motorcycle. And I, I can't absolutely confirm that. But that's the number that's always been in my head. Uh, it was never clear to me if Steve was able to retain ownership of his beautiful Harleys or if in the true spirit of kibbutz, they'd become the property of the community. One day while paying Steve a visit at the mechanic's shop, I was reminded of the two unusual occurrences that happened during the grape harvest in France. Steve and I were chatting outside of the shop and I noticed this cement trough sort of thing that was full of water. I think it was used to check for leaks and big tires. I was thinking to myself, you could take, take a bath in that thing. While thinking this, Steve looked over and said, what? You could take a bath in that? I was thinking it, but I hadn't said it. What was this? I didn't know then, and I still don't know. I've decided it's just one of those mysteries of life, kind of like how Jillian Jolly managed to live in multiple houses at the same time. I think I'll mention here that with the exception of those occasional instances 
where my wife and I seem to be on the same page and thinking the same thing, there have not been any more occurrences like the ones in France or the one with Steve. That is, until just this last Christmas season. I'd gone to the annual Christmas party which was being held at the home of one of the physicians from the clinic where I worked. When entering the front door of the home, there was a little table with labels and markers laid out. Everyone was asked to put their name on a tag and also to write what kind of profession they would like to be involved with if they weren't doing what they were doing. I spent several minutes thinking what I would like to write and had just about settled on Lion Tamer. Before writing anything down, a gentleman who was standing by the table said to me, You could just put Lion Tamer. Honest to goodness, that's what he said. And I thought I had pretty much seen the last of those occurrences. Maybe Jilly or Jolly will have to explain that to me. Uh, let's see. Maybe Jilly or Jolly will have to explain to me what that's all about. In the end, I didn't write Lion Tamer on the tag. I went with Cowboy instead. Journal entry, Saturday, 326. Hello, at the moment, I'm at a moshav in the south called Irovat. Like the kibbutz about, left the kibbutz about two weeks ago and stopped here to see Peter. Peter was a, another kibbutz volunteer who, much like myself, came to Israel because it was a great place for a traveler to find work, have a roof over his head, and receive three squares a day. We ended up becoming very good friends and would ultimately find ourselves doing a little traveling together. Peter and I both worked in the chicken houses. Since leaving Israel, I've never had a great desire to do that job again. Shavuk is what I think we called it when catching chickens and turkeys for the market. I say think we called it because I've since tried to find correct spelling for this term and haven't been able to anywhere except for in my journal. If you've never had the pleasure of catching chickens or turkeys for market, be glad. It should be no surprise that a chicken would get pretty ticked off when it's being picked up by the feet, sometimes two or three chickens in each hand, and stuffed into a cage. Although I tried to stuff my chickens into the cage as humanely as possible, it wasn't too long before enough of them had pecked my hands and helped me not to feel quite so guilty about the unpleasant and very unfriendly task I was performing. And the turkeys could even peck you harder. Peter was originally from New Zealand. Although we were from different corners of the globe, he and I seemed to be on sort of similar spiritual journeys at this time in our lives. Like me, Peter was someone who at a younger age had been introduced to Jesus and who it seemed wanted to know him or know about him better. Also, like me, Peter was someone who at this chapter in his life was not opposed to complementing his spiritual journey with the addition of mind-altering drugs. Except for the very rare toke, I never really saw any drug use at Nakshun. This was until one of the festive Brazilian members of the community let Peter and I know that he had a special tea. Actually, he had a dried plant from the desert that if you made a tea out of it, would make you really high. Now that's the ticket. Not only did Peter and I take him up on his offer to enjoy a cup of tea, but we also ate the seeds used to brew it. Our friend from Brazil said that this would make it extra special. Probably an hour or so after tea time, Peter decided to wander off in one direction, and I chose to go another. While walking along a pathway near my room, I came upon Avilon, the nice American gentleman who taught me how to repair kerosene heaters. We had just begun to exchange a few words when suddenly, poof, he disappeared. Now that was different. I continued down the pathway and ran into Pepe. Pepe was another one of the Brazilian members of the kibbutz. He was a guy that always had a smile on his face and who always was, it was always a pleasure to talk to. As we approached one another, 
Pepe raised his hand in greeting and smiled. Then suddenly, poof, he disappeared. I had definitely never experienced anything like this before. It actually became a little scary because I became unsure what was real and what was a hallucination. I ended up going back to my room and trying to sleep, which I did off and on with some very weird accompanying dreams. At one point, I remember looking into the mirror and being a little freaked out at the size of my pupils. They were so large that it seemed that if I looked real close, I'd be able to see inside of my head. I knew I couldn't, but that was one of the many weird thoughts I was having. As strange as my desert plant tea experience was, Peter's, I found out later, was even more bizarre. From what he told me and from what some people who witnessed his hallucinogenic experience reported, Peter had what would probably be called a bad trip. Looking back, it's hard to believe that I was willing to brew up and drink a tea made from some dried desert plant which I knew absolutely nothing about, except that it got you really high and that our friend from Brazil hadn't died from the effects when he tried it. Interestingly enough, I had just read about this plant. I did not, however, make the connection between what I'd read and what we were sipping at our tea party. Shortly before our desert plant experience, I had finished reading a couple of books. The first one, The Drifter, by James Michener, told the stories of several young travelers in Europe and Africa. More than a few of my friends on kibbutz had read it, and the book seemed to be pretty much required reading for backpackers during the 70s. The second book, The Teachings of Don Juan, A Yaki Way of Knowledge, by Carlos Castaneda, was also circling around with the volunteers. It told of the drug-induced lessons learned by Carlos while an apprentice to a Yaqui Indian shaman sorcerer. All in all, quite a strange read. One of the drugs Carlos experienced during his apprenticeship was a plant called Datura, or Yerba del Diablo, or Devil's Weed. Mr. Castaneda tells how why under this drug's influence, he was turned into a crow and obtained the ability to fly. Wouldn't you know it, the dry desert seed pods that Peter and I made our cup of tea out of was, in fact, Yerba del Diablo. It wasn't until several years later that I learned our tea was indeed made from devil's weed. I also learned after the fact that high doses can be very poisonous and kill you. Not one of my better choices in life. It was Peter who first heard about Moshav Iravat. A Moshav is a communal settlement much like a kibbutz, except that as I understand it, the members of the community actually own more of their major possessions, things like their home, for instance, as, to pose, as opposed to kibbutz, where all the major assets are owned by the community. Iravat was a small settlement in the Arava region of, the, of northeastern Negev. The community was started by Rabbi Simcha Perlmutter, or Sandy, as we came to know him. Rumor was that Sandy, although an Orthodox Jew, was also a believer in Jesus. We also understood that Rabbi Sandy was the proud husband of two wives. Iravat was a community unlike any other in Israel, to be sure. We had heard that if Rabbi Sandy liked you, it would be possible to volunteer and participate with them making the desert blossom as the rose, as prophesied in Isaiah 35.1, where it says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. If invited to stay in the community, and being that Iravat operated a tomato farm, we would be participating with the desert blossoming as the tomato. Peter had gone on to Iravat about a week before me and had been invited to stay. I, too, ended up becoming a volunteer in this very unique little garden in the desert. I never was able to really get a grasp on Rabbi Sandy's theological views, despite attempting on a few occasions to sit down and talk to him specifically about his belief in Jesus. Our conversations always seemed to be diverted into some other direction. 
With what little I did learn, I would say that yes, Rabbi Perlmutter was a believer in Jesus or Yeshua. What that meant to him exactly, I never found out. And as to why Sandy felt that he should be blessed with two lovely significant others at the same time, I never found an answer to that either. Iravat, although small, did seem to have a pretty robust little tomato farm going. Each day we would spend several hours picking the tomatoes, and each and every day, Grandma, I believe she was Sandy's mother, would bring freshly baked chocolate cake and milk out to the fields for us to enjoy. Every day. It was awesome. As interesting as it was to learn a little about tomato farming, it was even more impressive and even kind of inspiring to see the desert blossom like the rose and to actually be involved with the process. The tomatoes grown at Iravat, by the way, were really very delicious. When not working, Peter and I would often find ourselves exploring the surrounding area. Living in the desert sometimes felt a little like something from another era, or even like something from Bible times. Taking a walk and running into some friendly local camels, for instance, or visiting a nearby Bedouin tent and enjoying a cup of tea prepared on a little open fire was almost surreal. It, it was wonderful. When just hanging out in the community, I would often play a game called Shashbash, or backgammon, with Sandy's son. Although he was just a youngster, he almost always won. Uh, I think now after 40 years, I'm going to have to learn how to play that game again. Although Iravat didn't seem to receive a lot of guests, at least while I was there, we did one day have a visit from an Israeli soldier who was on sort of an unusual vacation. This young guy had apparently always wanted to take a trip across the desert on a camel. He and his trusty beast showed up one afternoon in search of water. Not only did they receive their water, but I'm almost positive that the young soldier also enjoyed a piece of Grandmama's delicious chocolate cake before they hit the road, or rather the desert, again. Journal entry continued Saturday, 326. We went to Nueva and met Averett on the way to Ilat. It's been a good time for a couple days. Beautiful sunshine and a good place to run around naked. Also some beautiful coral and tropical fish. Peter and I decided to take a little break from Iravat. So I have to apologize. Um, my phone's ringing. So I'm going to give that a second to stop ringing. And then we'll continue. Peter and I decided to take a little break from Iravat. So after filling a bag with tomatoes for the road, we hitched a ride to Elat. Elat is a port town located on the northern tip of the Red Sea on the Gulf of Aqaba. While there, we met up with Avert, who was also a volunteer at Nakshan. Avert and his lovely sister Rita were originally from the Netherlands and had left their careers at home to come to volunteer in Israel. Avert was an optometrist by profession and was working in the glass factory at the kibbutz. From a lot, the three of us caught a ride in the back of a truck Destination Nueva. In the 70s, Nueva, at least what I saw of it, pretty much just consisted of a dive shop, a lot of beach and blue water, and a kiosk where you could buy pita bread and hummus to go along with your bag of tomatoes. Delicious. Visitors to this beautiful little oasis seem to pretty much be comprised of dive enthusiasts, travelers like myself, young Israeli soldiers on holiday, uh, and a few old hippies. It was also a popular place for those who appreciated the freedom to run around naked. The soft sandy beaches, clear blue water, beautiful coral, and multicolored fish were all pretty spectacular. And truth be told, consider, considering that swimwear was not required, I may have noticed one or two of the beautiful female beachcombers during our stay. On a side note, Nueva is thought by some to be the site where Moses and the children of Israel 
crossed over into the promised land. If it was, I feel pretty very I feel pretty privileged to have had the opportunity to sleep on the beach at such a historic location. In 1976, we didn't have to cross a border to go to Nueva as the Sinai Peninsula was still under Israeli occupation. The peace treaty with Egypt would not be signed until 1979, and likewise, the subsequent withdrawal of Israel from the Sinai would not be completed until 1982. For the last week, I've been back at the Moshav with Peter. Yesterday, Yossi, one of the members of the settlement, came back from a wedding in Beersheba and brought with him his very nice cousin Shlemit. She is, a very, she is very special, and we had some nice times talking. At the moment, I'm suffering from a million mosquito bites. It's been more than worth it, though. I know the bit about mosquito bites is a little random, but it's what was in my journal. Tomorrow morning, I'll get a ride in the truck to Tel Aviv. Hopefully, I'll get to see Ronnie. After that, Peter and I will meet at the kibbutz. Saturday, 327. Today was fantastic. Came into Tel Aviv with Kenny and Bob. Kenny and Bob were both members of Yerevat and were making a tomato delivery. After arriving, I was able to phone Ronnie and we met on the beach. It was a very beautiful afternoon and Ronnie, Ronnie is a very fantastic girl. There are so many really nice people that need to be remembered. God, you are so fantastic to give all the things that you do. I, real, I really feel happy about lots of things. Thanks so much. Monday, 4-4. Peter and I are now in Athens. It's really beautiful. We arrived yesterday on the plane. The last week on the kibbutz was fun. Peter and I spent most of our time catching chickens. Saturday night, we celebrated Passover with a big meal and also managed to get a little messy. It was fun. On Wednesday, Ronnie called, so on Thursday, we met in Tel Aviv. She's really a lovely girl. The only reason I most hated to leave Israel was the people. There were so many nice ones. Hopefully, we'll meet again. Today, I really could have kicked myself. Peter and I sold blood, and I got about $13 or 400 drachma. Well, we were going back to the train station and saw a man doing a game with cards. It looked like a game that you couldn't lose. Right. Guess what? I lost. Another lesson learned. Don't gamble unless you've got enough money to lose. Well, that concludes uh, Chapter 9, Kibbutz. Next time, we'll be looking at Chapter 10, Go West, Young Man. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you then. Adios.